Major support for Do The Math has been provided by Chevron, the Kern County Superintendent of Schools, Edison International, Valley Strong Credit Union, Panama Buena Vista Union School District, and the Kern High School District. With additional production assistance provided by these supporters of education in Kern County and throughout the state of California. Well, good afternoon and welcome to Do the Math. I'm Michael. I'm Mickey. I'm Andrew. And for home, for math homework, help call in Biggersfield, 636-4357. Everywhere else, 1-866-636-6284. And email dothemath at kern.org. And we're online at dothemathonline.net. And the, on, face, on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. All right, nicely done. So, Andrew, where do you go to school and what grade are you in? Um, I go to Sing Lum and I'm in sixth grade. I was sixth grade. Good. You had a little field trip yesterday, right? Yes. Where did you go? Um, we went to Tevis Junior High. And why did you guys go over there? To like, see like, the different um, musics there. And, yeah. So the different like, classes that they have or electives and things like that? Yeah. Uh, like, with that has to do with music. I, yeah. Okay, oh, well, it's like so band, you're in band, chorus, right? orchestra. Yes. Okay. okay. And what do you play in band right now? Um, a cornet, or basically just uh, if you squish a trumpet, sort of. Okay, so yeah. Mick, you're familiar with this, right? Yeah, when I, when I was in elementary school, no one played the cornet, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Our music teacher, Mrs. Willie, did. Um, and I believe she's the band director over at yeah. Tevis, right? So did she connect with you at all? Like, hey, you play the cornet, I play no. the cornet. All right, well, are you, do you plan on playing? Yeah. In seventh grade? Yes. All right, I'm, I'm telling you right now, she's going to be like, you play the cornet? <laughs> You're my favorite. That's yeah. <laughs> Not a lot of students play the cornet. Things like the cornet, bassoon, oboe, those those um, atypical instruments. Yeah. You're going to have a great time because you're going to have your own sheet music. No one else has touched it because no one else has really played it. <laughs> so you're in for some clean music sheets when you go to seventh grade. Good. So that's something to look forward to. Uh, what kinds of math are you doing in sixth grade uh, right We're now? doing uh, percents and then... Um Converting them into like decimals and fractions. Okay, and, like stuff and like you that. feel pretty comfortable with yes. that? Good. So we'll have you do a couple of those, but we'll do something a little more exciting than just going take a fraction and turn it into a decimal and turn it into yeah. a fraction. <laughs> so we'll do something with that. Are you ready to help me with our social media problem of the day? Yes. All right, let's take a look at it together right now. Speaking of percents, here it is. It says the decimal equivalent to 1%. So what do you think is the decimal equivalent to 1%? So what are you um, thinking of, first of all? Uh, B0.01. Okay, so that was pretty quick. So why did you think that one automatically? Because I know that um, if it was uh, one hundredth, I mean not one hundredth, one tenth, it would be 10%, and 1% one, 1 would be um, one hundredth. So, okay, yeah, so, so well, I'm curious, why do you say one hundredth? Right. When you say for 1%, because like students not, might, you know, not to say you're yeah. right or wrong, I'm just looking for, like, help me understand, or for students watching, they might think, well, where'd you get 100th? It sounds like a fraction, it, even though it's a decimal, or a percentage. Because it goes uh, tenths, hundredths, thousandths, um, and uh, decimals, I guess. Okay, so going like the decimal place value to smaller uh, values as yes. you go to the right of the decimal, students think, oh, it's to the right, it's bigger, but in decimals, it actually gets smaller. Yes. Okay. So why do you think C is up there? Uh, they might just think 1% is just 1. Right, because yeah. 1.0, right? Mm -hmm. So you're pretty confident because you say B pretty quick. You feeling good with that? You don't yes. want to alter it at all? Nope. All right, let's take a look. He says B with confidence. B yeah. it is. There you go. Nicely done. First problem done. 636-4357 is that phone number. We do have phone tutors available most Tuesdays and Wednesdays throughout the regular school year. Time now for today's Math in the News. All right, today's Math in the News. Well, it is Valentine's Day, so happy Valentine's Day to everybody that likes to celebrate Valentine's Day. And I know in schools they had a lot of parties, uh, goodies and things like that based yeah. on whatever grade level they are. I would assume the level, degree of partiness, I guess, whatever Absolutely. goes on. But uh, anyway, Dr. Sandu is in studio with us today. Thank yes, you thanks. for coming with us. Thanks for having so, me. So where do you work and what is your title? 
So I'm an interventional cardiologist, which means um, I see patients with heart disease, and uh, if they have blockages, if they have heart attacks, I go in and open the arteries, whether that be in the heart or the legs. So that's kind of what I do. And uh, we work at California Cardiovascular Institute. That's on Brim Hall and Coffee. Okay. That's an office with two, uh, two partners and uh, my nurse practitioner. So how did you, so I take it you've been doing this for a while? Yes. Okay, and how did you get interested in this field? So I like medicine in general, but uh, when I was doing my training, what attracted me to cardiology was it's very procedure oriented and very specific. I think once you see, live that experience where you see someone coming with heart attack, whether it's late evening, middle of the night, and everything is kind of chaotic, the person mm -hmm. is in trouble, and you go in and saw someone opening the blood vessel, everything goes back to normal in minutes, the person feels better, nothing more gratifying than that feeling. Right. So that's what you live for. So that's kind of what got me into it. And some good training, right? Absolutely. To make sure that you can do this, you know, when needed. Absolutely. And as quickly as possible. Absolutely. Minutes count at that point. Right. Because I was going to say, there's got to be a matter of time where then things are getting affected. Exactly. So when it comes time for a heart attack, I mean, you respond to it, even if it's in the middle of the night, you're on call, you go in right there. It's not for the morning. Someone comes with heart attack, the whole team rushes in. You get in midnight, two o'clock, you get in, you open within minutes. That's what you do. Which is what you want. Yeah. All right. So we're talking about the heart of Valentine's Day, and a lot of students are, you know, familiar with the heart mm -hmm. symbol like that, mm -hmm. right? And I always like to talk about the human heart. And I'm especially happy that one of our producers was able to get this photograph of the human heart right. and see the actual size when somebody is holding it. Correct. And so, I mean, you could actually hold it in one hand. Absolutely. Right? But they're holding it lovingly, let's say, with yeah. two hands, right, to make sure nothing happens to it. And there's some different facts up here. Um, and it talks about how the heart of a blue whale mm -hmm. weighs over 1,000 pounds, which is the weight of a cow. Correct. So that, for students, might seem kind of, well, that's pretty big. I mean, you take a look at a cow, yep. and that's simply the size of a heart, heart inside. That's how big a whale is. Correct. So just some uh, things like that. Symmetry. So the beats per minute. So that's for an adult or for somebody younger, old? No, that's, I mean, that's an average for an adult. Okay. Uh, the kid's hearts will beat faster. And so why it, is that? That's just the higher metabolic demands. So what we kind of don't realize both in kids' brains and the body, there is a ton of activity going on. Um, I mean, if you go back, why do kids sleep so much? It's not that they like sleeping so much. The brain is processing so much that they can only stay active for that time. They and then need they, that rest. they need that rest. Similarly, the whole body is active. Things are being synthesized. The growth is happening. The body needs that kind of. And the metabolic rate is what you were talking Correct. about, right? And as you get older, that slows. Correct which is why as an old man, I don't get as much sleep as I used to when I was younger, but you don't require as much either. Correct. So we see that the human heart weighs about a pound. Mm -hmm. And why is a man's heart just had to get a little heavier mm -hmm. than a woman's? In general, the body size. So a general theme here is you go to the, we saw the whale's heart that much bigger in general. Men so males a little are usually bigger, bigger than a little, females. Usually a little bit bigger. Okay. But an average size is about a uh, fist size. That's kind of what it is. And when somebody says they can hear the beating of your heart, mm -hmm. that is actually the valves Correct. opening and closing. So there are four major valves in the heart, two on the left side, one which controls between the upper and the lower chambers, as you show in the figure, and one on the right side between the upper and lower, and then the two that regulate the blood flow going out of the heart. From the right side, the blood goes to the lungs to get the oxygen, okay. and that part is regulated by pulmonary valve, because pulmonary goes with the lungs. And on the left side, it's the artery aorta, which comes out and supplies blood to the rest of the body. And that's what is governed by the aortic valve. And so I know a lot of students, when they're first learning about this, um, <clears throat> probably lower elementary school, mm -hmm. and they hear about arteries and veins. Correct. Now, correct me if I'm mistaken, and I certainly hope you will. Arteries are carrying the blood away from the heart. Correct. The oxygenated blood goes in the arteries, going to different organs to deliver oxygen to them. The blood with less oxygen or deoxygenated blood 
is coming back in the veins to the right side of the heart. Okay. And the right side in turn will pump it to the lungs where oxygen will enter the blood again. And then it goes back to the left side which will pump it to the arteries. So constantly circulating. And a lot of people think that their heart is on their left side. That is in fact correct. Is it more central though? It's more towards, it? it's kind of somewhere in this zone, but it'll be different for everyone because the body is about mechanics. So if there's someone with a bigger belly, what's that going to do? Push it up and the heart, instead of being like this, will go a little horizontal. Okay. And if someone- Now is that a very serious problem because of it's the way it's- No, it's a serious problem in, in terms of other health issues, but just by the positioning itself, not so much. Okay. Now, more like serious changes in position, like some people are born with right-sided heart and whatnot, or malrotations, that may be issues in some people and some people not, but just this position, not so much. Okay, well, let's take a look at heart disease because this is your mm -hmm. area. Yep. Okay, um, arrhythmia. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about that. So two parts of the heart, one is the blood supply, the other part of diseases is the rhythm abnormalities. So there is an area in the top right side, which is called the SA node, senoatrial node, that's where the impulse or the natural pacemaker originates. That leads in turn to a whole cascade of ion channels, sodium and potassium going in and out along with calcium to create the beating, but all that traverses through the conduction system of the heart, which goes from the top as a little kind of breaker in the middle between the top and bottom chambers and then spreads to both sides. Okay. And if there are abnormalities in the rhythm system, in the electrical system, that's what will be create arrhythmias or not the regular normal beating. And the student's going to be looking at this going, all right, I see these figures down at the bottom here, A, B, and C. Mm -hmm. uh, well, A, you know, there's stuff in there. B, it looks kind of like netting or mesh. And then mm -hmm. C, you've got it again. So and most adults are going to go, all right, we understand what's going on. But for the students that are looking at this, kind of explain what's going on with A, B, and C. So basically, you're looking at the inside of an artery. So the heart is mainly supplied by three major arteries, the front, the LED, the side, the circumflex, and the back, the right coronary artery. So these are three major arteries. And the blockage inside them is going to look somewhat like this if you cut the artery through. Okay. So what this is showing is if I see a blockage, what am I going to do? This is like a 90% blockage. So where the white arrow is going in picture A, that's where I'll put my small wire through it. And over that wire, I'll thread a balloon to kind of expand squish it. the blockage, okay. expand that area. And then the metallic mesh that you see, that's kind of the making of a stent. And okay. that'll keep it open. And then you've got the good flow going again it, in C exactly. right there. All right. And how long of a process is that? to do that? It depends. If the blockage is simple enough, soft enough in some people, barely takes five, ten minutes to do that. But some complicated ones may take a lot longer if there's a lot of calcification, which becomes almost hard like a rock. It's okay. almost like a rock. So it's harder to get that harder, off and out of there. Exactly. So then you got to use special tools to kind of drill through it or burn through it. And so are there times when you might see this and you're like, all right, I got that, and then something comes up and you're like, ah, there must be something else down the line a little more and we got to get and that one now. Exactly, and that happens. Sometimes you go in and then when you start fixing it, it's a lot more involved than that, so that occasionally does happen. Okay, so let's take a look at a healthy art, which is what we all want. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got a photograph of the old man doing one of my uh, runs right there. But down here, I mean, we can see and the kids can see that on the screen, you know, the beats per minute and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But as far as keeping your heart healthy, it says eat healthy. So mm -hmm. what does that mean for students? They're like, all right, eat healthy. I, I just won't eat candy a lot. But it means more than that. It, it definitely does. So there are two parts to it. Uh, candy, as you mentioned. So sugars are particularly detrimental. For years, we thought that just the holy grail of heart disease is cholesterol, which is, still is a big part of mm -hmm. it. But the sugar leading to metabolic syndrome, which means the whole process within the body, the biochemical processes change in a way which adversely affects the heart along with other organs. And that's what's leading to the shift of heart disease to younger and younger age groups. And obesity, fat deposition, those are big parts of it. Okay. And what the, some of the bigger culprits in kids that I see are the easy ones, the liquid calories. That's what's most detrimental. Sodas, 
Oh, of okay. any sort. Sugary drinks. Sugary drinks. Even juicy, sports drinks. Even sports drinks. Gatorade has a ton of sugar propel. Right. Not targeting any particular brand, but that's kind of what it is. Ton of sugar, and there is a like a place for such drinks. Perhaps after a sports event, you can have a little bit of that. That's fine. But if you are regularly consuming big amounts of juices, juices are not as healthy as people would think to be. Fructose right. metabolism leads yeah, to anything fat with the os. Exactly. You know, is going to have the sugars in it exactly. for you. So when people are looking at ingredients and things, sucrose, fructose, anything, you know, with the os basically at the Correct. end of it. Correct. Absolutely. Should be a little trigger. Should for be you. a little trigger. Then of course candies and chocolates and some cereals which are sugar laden. So the habit for the parents, I would say, along with the kids, is to look at the labels. Is what right. we get. get in the habit of looking at the labels. So as a uh, guy in my 60s, mm -hmm. doing this is going to help me. Absolutely. The exercise is a big part of it. So I would say 30 to 45 minutes off robust activity, five to six days a week minimum. That's what we need. And there is some data that a little bit of weight training along with that goes a long way. OK. And for Kids and adults are like you like weight training. That doesn't mean all right. I need not to lift heavy weights all the no. time and stuff like that. Simple things, resistance right, bands, body to be weight exercises. Like body weight exercises. That's good enough. You don't need to lift super heavy. No, okay. it's just toning. Well, Dr. Sandhu, we certainly do appreciate you coming in this afternoon and talking a little bit about the heart on Valentine's Day, where everybody thanks thinks so hearts. much. I will fail in my full task if I fail to mention my three kids oh, who right. help me with all this technical stuff that's put on the slides. I'm terrible at it, so yesterday was Anil, but Arsh and Arine, they come through whenever I need them. So thanks, for, thanks to them. And stick around for just a minute because we need to get these guys back to work. All so right. Mickey and Andrew are going to head up there. All right. And I know you guys are going to be working on a, uh, an equation right now. So we've got two open parentheses, 5 minus x, close parentheses, plus 6x is equal to x plus 22. <laughs> x plus 22. Is that it? That is it. All right. So talk to me, Andrew. What do you notice? Have you seen this before? Are you familiar with it? OK, what do we know? Uh, so first, we need to multiply the 2 by the 5 and the negative x to, um, like to basically, that's the first stuff. Step. OK. Do you know the academic term for when we multiply the 2 to the 5 um, and the negative x? I, I, I know I did, I did answer, uh, distribute? Yeah, yeah, distributive property, very yeah. nice. All right, so go ahead and show me what that would become, multiplying 2 times 5 and 2 times negative two x. 2 times 5 is 10, and 2 times negative x is negative 2x. Yeah, all right. Is that, are we done? Is that our final step? No, no. Okay. And then plus 6x equals x. Now, I notice some of these terms, right, we call each piece for like 10's a term, negative 2x, positive 6x, these mm -hmm. are terms. Some have a variable and some do not. Yeah. So what's the rule on us combining or not combining certain terms in this equation? To combine like terms, for example, negative 2x and positive 6x. So those are like terms? Yes. What makes them a like term? Because they both have a variable or an x, I guess. So if this one had a y and this one had an x, even though they both have a variable, could I combine them? No, they're, they're different variables. Okay, so that has to be the same variable. Yeah. Got it. Okay, take me through it. Show me what you want to do. So, this 10, because we're not going to do anything. And then okay. two, 6x minus 2x is 4x. So, 4x equals x plus 22. There. Now, one thing I want you to double check. So, you said 6x minus 2x, correct? Yeah. 4x. Mm -hmm. Now, 4. Is 4 positive or negative when it's on its own? Uh, positive. So I just want to, oh, just, yeah. a, just the, some of those oh. little things that some students might think, oh, Ms. Kushner, it's 104x. And I'm like, where are you getting that from? And then I look at their notes or their work and I say, oh, okay. oh wait a minute, I forgot a plus sign or something. So okay. nice job. Looks great so far. Keep going. And then um, we need to uh, get the variable on one side. Okay. So we, <coughs> we either need to do minus, wait, my, think, minus 4x, uh, to uh, minus to four x and x, or just minus x, which is basically just one x. Okay, so we need to figure out yeah. if we want to have the variable on the left or right side. Yeah. I'm okay, so which side do you want to go with? I'm gonna go with uh, left. Okay, I mean, so not left, right. So you want to take right. it from the left side, and move it to the right. Yes. Okay, sure. So 
minus 4x and minus 4x and... So is it kind of like a puzzle? Yeah. I think with some students, I, t I teach sixth grade, my students will look at me and think, wait a minute, I can't, I can't do that. I'm like, it's like pieces. You can take 4x and move it to one side just like you're doing. So if we do that, ah, negative 3x. All right, so we got the variable on one side. Boom, are we done? No. All right, keep it going. What do we got next? Um, so we got yeah, the variable. So we have the variable on one yeah. side. Mm -hmm. Can I combine 22 with negative 3x? No. So we need to move the 22 to go with another like term. Yeah. If it's not a like with this, because it doesn't have a variable, is there yeah. anything else that does not have a variable? A 10. Aha. Uh -huh. So, but like you showed me, do we have the ability to take a term from one side and transfer it to the other? No, but we can um, subtract from both sides or no, so I mean, divide. Yeah, yeah. By or subtracting, or you're going to take it from one side and transfer it to the other. Kind of like you did with the positive 4x. We did minus 4x to move it from the left to the right. So show me, how would you move that plus 22 to the other side? Maybe, uh, uh, I'm not exactly sure. You're on it. You did it already. Um, when you had plus 4x, we wanted to combine it with the other x, correct? So minus, no, no, not minus. Mm -hmm. wait, wait, minus 22? Yeah, minus, okay. yeah, 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 absolutely. Minus 22. All right. Okay, so that is... Negative 12? Yeah, I kind of, you know, a lot of my students think, I don't know, so I think about like money. If I have $10 and I spend 22, I owe $12. Then. Boom! All right, are we done now? No. Ah. We need to divide. All right, keep it going. I don't we divide by 3? Why are you yeah. saying divide by 3? What gives you that because idea? Because it's the one with the x game. We need to just have x, nothing else. But why dividing? Because why not subtract or multiply or uh, anything else? It's just what I've taught, been taught, I guess. I love it, and that's totally fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Here's what I'm going to tell you. Mm -hmm. So this three, the academic term for the three, is called a coefficient. Oh. You ever heard of that term before? No, I haven't. So a coefficient is the, the value. Could be a fraction, mm -hmm. decimal, whole number, negative number, doesn't matter. A coefficient is the value that is connected directly with the variable. Okay. Now, any time they are directly touching, let's kind of go back up to the top real fast. When you had the two touching the parentheses, your mind told you to do what with that two and the five? And multiply. Yes. So in math, when we have two terms directly touching each other without an addition or subtraction symbol, our mind will automatically click multiply. Oh. So three touching the x is the same as three times x. You ever seen that dot before? Yeah, it's a multiplication. Aha. As you go into seventh and eighth grade, you will stop seeing a multiplication symbol because more often than not, that x really should be a variable. Does that make sense so to you? So as you guys keep going, yeah. let's make sure that that 3x that you had down there is a negative 3x. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh look, yeah. see? Yeah, Mike's always on. He's on it. All right. So we got negative 3x. Now, if we divide it by negative 3 on one side, if we follow that pattern, we add it right up top. We, we added 4 on one side. So we added 4 on the other. So we subtracted 4, subtracted 4. Subtract 22, subtract 22. We seem to have this pattern where the equal sign forces me to do one thing on one side and yeah. the same on the other. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're thinking divide 3 here. You have to divide negative 3 on here. All right. Boom. So this just equals x. Right, equals 1 or 1x, one one yep. And then negative 12 divided, I believe, 4? Positive or negative? Yeah, po positive. All right. There you go. Nicely done. So you got x is equal to 4. Love it. Nicely done. So while we're taking our next break, you'll be able to check that. But for an awesome first problem right there, you've got yourself a meal courtesy of our friends at Grillin' Burger. So Whoa, you guys, yeah. that. Like that. you guys can take a look at that. Yeah, there while we go. We, we learn a little moves. bit more about <laughs> an athletic trainer at Fresno Pacific. All right, well, today we are at Fresno Pacific University with Isaiah Spears, an athletic trainer for the university. How are you today? Good, how are you? I'm excellent. So for students that are watching, what does an athletic trainer do or kind of what is your role, if you can explain that? So an athletic trainer is a healthcare professional that deals in treatment, 
uh, prevention and rehabilitation of injuries, usually in the athletic population, especially in the collegiate setting here. We are in charge of teams overseeing their health care, making sure that the athletes are safe and just keeping them as healthy as they can so they can keep performing in their sports free of injury. And I think a key was preventative there also, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've got Rebecca, a swimmer here at the university, and some of the most common injuries I would imagine are probably to knees and shoulders. Yes, that's what we see very often, knees and shoulders, especially in swim where there's a repetitive motion happening constantly. Okay, and I would, if Rebecca has an injury to one of her shoulders, mm -hmm preventative but she's kind of aching right now yes so the first thing is you would use what first she would come in we'd do a little evaluation see what kind of pain level she's at how, what how bad is this injury essentially in this case um, maybe looking at tape wise it hurts but she can push through a little bit so how can I make this injury not as severe. Okay, and I know a lot of students will see professional athletes and collegiate athletes and they'll go, well, they got a lot of tape on them and why is the tape there mm -hmm. and not all over and why is it that size? So if you can explain a little bit about that for us. Gotcha. What we use tape often for is possibly to help stabilize an area to help prevent further injury from happening or in a case like this where we're dealing with water in the pool, we would use tape in a sense to help enhance the motion that she does to try and limit the amount of pain that she would feel in the pool. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the tape. So right here, we would just have um, your average KT tape. Some I know this is pretty popular amongst athletes, especially in the high school. The, the use of this specifically is that it's very stretchable and it provides good biofeedback to the athlete. So whatever position that we put her in and apply the tape based on the stretch, she might feel a pull or tension to kind of help remind her, oh, I need to make sure I'm keeping my shoulder back when I'm going through my stroke. So is this something that you would go, all right, move your arm and then base it? Essentially, As yeah. it's in that motion, would, then apply the tape? Yes, okay. I would try to put her in the most optimal position possible, then apply the tape so that she is set, essentially, ready to go out there. Okay, so are we ready to kind of yes, apply some tape? And so she'll just pull the shirt off on that side so we can get access to the shoulder. And the main thing I'm going to be working here would be her upper trapezius muscle here, which is often a very big cause for shoulder pain and bad shoulder position, and her external rotators. I'm going to try and keep that upper trapezius down and pull our external rotators in so that they're in a lot more prime position and not have such forward shoulder motion. Okay. So over here, she has dry skin. She doesn't have any lotion on, so that would help prevent uh, the tape from sticking. Just gonna tear the tape a little bit. I'm gonna have you pull that back and push down just a little bit. So this will be for the top. And how long will the tape stay on? So the tape usually will stay on about two to three days. It's most effective, especially with KT, uh, in about the first 24 hours, that's when she'll feel it the most. Um, but this effect and uh, helpfulness can still go on for the next 48, 72 hours until it starts to kind of peel and fall off, which then we would go back and put some more on in that case, if this was something that she enjoyed. Okay, and I was going to say, so Rebecca, you felt that first piece of tape go on and I can see Isaiah stretching it to go further down your back area, right? So can you feel that right now with just that one piece on? Yeah. <laughs> okay, and it's, it's not, it, is it comforting or is it kind of? Yeah, I mean, it still feels like I need another. Okay, so you can tell. Yeah. Okay. So for this one, I'm going to have her kind of go into external rotation a little bit of that shoulder. I'll anchor this piece to the front and then pull the rest of this back. And while you're doing that, how long does it take to learn to properly tape? Is that, I mean, something you're learning as you go through your program and yes. schooling. Um, but obviously it probably gets better as you as, come up with experience. As time so. goes on, you get more and more uh, adept at what you want to do and your taping style. Generally it takes about two years, which is what most programs run for athletic training, to be proficient. 
in taping, but the longer you're in the profession, the more tricks you pick up and you start really finding out ways that work best for you and best for your athletes on what tape works and what doesn't. At the end of the day, tape isn't gonna be the end-all fix-all. And in some cases where pain is just way too much of an issue, we would go to something like treatment. All right, well, let's take a look at that next. Awesome. All right. A big thanks to Fresno Pacific for inviting us up there and also a big thanks to Isaiah Spears and uh, his volunteers to uh, help illustrate everything that we've been learning about an athletic trainer. So in studio with us, we have Julie Parsons. How are you today? I'm great. How are you? I'm excellent. Nice to have you here and a happy Thank Valentine's you. Day. Thank you. Happy and, Valentine's Day. Uh, we're just gonna, I mean, that was your doctor that was here. Yes. That yes, was pretty awesome was that wonderful. your doctor happened to be on the same day that you're here. Yeah, and hopefully I don't have to see him again. Right, and I'm like, all right, you know, I might have to see him. <laughs> yeah, you know, make sure everything is wonderful. Going to be wonderful. fine and stuff like that. Yeah. So you are here to talk with us about early <clears throat> childhood education and where math is all around it. And you worked for a while with the Kern County Superintendent of Schools Office. What was your role here? I worked 34 years with the office. Um, I had many roles. I started at Community Connection for Child Care, and from there went to Curriculum Instruction. Um, I was the uh, facilitator for the Kern County uh, for the uh, Kern County um, <laughs> Network for Children for okay. a while, and then <clears throat> on to the California Preschool Instructional Network. So your focus, your career has been early. Early education, okay. early childhood. All right, and I know we've got some slides we're going to look at, and the first we one are. is books. Books, but uh, yeah, I mean, and this is an obvious um, for early education. The more we read to children. Um, and the more different types of books that we read, there's usually math in just about every book that you read to a child. And I think that when you said reading to kids, and e reading to them even before they can read is oh, important, absolutely. right? It's not like they have to be able to read and follow along with you. No, just even looking at the pictures and having somebody talk about the pictures, what's in the picture. So not only are we talking about math necessarily in a book, but we're just creating that love of reading. And you talk about <laughs> books, and even the page numbers help students understand kids, you know, like, oh, numbers and how they go in order. Have you ever heard of Ulam numbers? No, I haven't. There's not. a book that has the pages marked in Ulam numbers, and that's a little something okay. for you to look up later I, on. I am. Right? I'm going to Google. We are going to move on. Okay. So what is this young man doing here? So what I want to get across is that math happens all day, everywhere in early education. <clears throat> we love to use children's bodies. When children can actually use their physical body, it... Um, makes it, more sense it, to them also. Well, it's it makes personal. more sense and it, and it becomes um, more ingrained in that child. So maybe the teacher is talking about um, non-standard standard units of measure and standard units of measure. So we're gonna talk about this little guy and how many, let's say his name was Kevin, how many Kevins does it take to go across the room. Okay. Okay. So it's it's actually talking about measurement, but using that child as right. that Right. Using measurement. different items, let's say. Exactly. Because right? people use used to hands. go, well, how many hands is it? Exactly. And things like that. Exactly. Good. So how many Kevins does it take to get across the room? Absolutely. All right. Well, this looks fun. Well, I would and go that, engineering and building and art. You know. Well, building and bridges and. As I said, math is everywhere. And so when we look at children just in the play environment, what are they doing here? They're building, so they're stacking blocks. You might be talking about how many blocks are being stacked. They might, it looks to me like that may, uh, may be on a slant. Mm -hmm. So maybe now they're gonna talk about motion and how fast the cars are going down the slant. Um, a number of interactive math opportunities in this one picture. And again, children are having fun. Well, well that's the whole key, and, right? And the thing is, if there's a teacher interacting with it, it brings out so much more language and opportunities for And I think uh, the math. students working together, right? Absolutely. Building off of each other's vocabulary and different experiences. Well, and that's another really key um, to early education is that social and emotional development. So working together, building friendships, all of that's so important. I love this picture. Uh, Doing not a lot of outdoor work. <laughs> a lot of, so math is outside. So how many shovelfuls does it take 
to fill the 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 bucket right. or the the wheelbarrow. Not only is he maybe filling the wheelbarrow with uh, so many loads, but he's also using his uh, large motor skills. So he's he's using the shovel, and you know large motor skills are critical before children can use their small motor skills because of the way the body develops physically. So using those large motor skills, counting how many um, Shovelfuls, Shovelfuls it takes, it it takes. is it heavy, is it light, all of okay. those are math skills and math concepts that they will learn. And here we have shapes. Geometry. Right. You know, we do it all in early education. Uh, so it's like kids, well, they're like, how are you going to do algebra? And they're like, oh, all right, you've been doing it since preschool, kindergarten. You, you yeah. just haven't realized it. That's we all. do it all. They just didn't call it algebra then. Well, we're starting to. Oh, good. So that people understand that we are laying that foundation. It's not something you have to wait for or is more difficult later on. We're doing it now. You're doing it now. Right. But we're doing it and we're having fun. And so, obviously, you know, putting shapes together to build other shapes. Um, the other thing that's happening here is sorting. Right. Maybe they're and there's different sort. ways they can sort based on the attributes that they want to use. Absolutely. So color, shape, size, all that. This is another really important slide because, as I said, math happens everywhere. Well, I'm glad you got the day. food in here because I'm particularly fond of snack time. Yes. Yeah, well, so why would this be important? Maybe the teacher had that apple and they had to figure out how many slices they need. So they were dividing. We were talking about algebra. Mm -hmm. They were dividing that apple depending on the number of children. Fractional parts. Exactly. Absolutely. Um, again, planting the garden, watching things grow, how high is it versus how high it was yesterday, mm -hmm. how high is it going to be in two days. Um, so again, measurement. And then the different things with weather you can be also introducing. Oh, there's, uh, yeah, there's so much going on there because you can talk about the sun and the water and what's needed. Well, these folks look like they're uh, so this ready is, for their career. Uh -huh. <laughs> this was a veterinary hospital that they had. This was taken at Bakersfield City School District. And this was our veterinarian for the day. And you could see they have their animals in the background. But they were writing prescriptions. They were taking temperatures, using all kinds of different math skills. How many animals did they have that day? How many patients? And when you're talking about temperature, you could even advance it a little more and ask them if they're doing it in Fahrenheit or in Celsius. There you go. And then get them into different things like that also. So you could. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. So we at the beginning of this we were talking about books and we have one right here that is directly related to mathematics. Absolutely. This one's all about shapes. Um, and as I was going through, I was looking at it and there's some wonderful um, illustrations in this book. And children can pick out different shapes. Just asking the child, what shapes do you see? Mm -hmm. Tell me about the shapes that you see in this book. And there's a number of them. They're not, um, there's ovals, there's squares, there's triangles, there's circles. So just talking about that and again, giving them the language. And when, I mean, because some adults might even be watching going, uh, all right, so you're talking about early childhood and you're talking about preschool and TK and stuff like that. But I think we can go even earlier than that, correct? As far as activities and recognizing things and talking about them. As soon as a baby, I mean, yes, is absolutely. able to, I mean, there's an amazing amount of things that a baby can do that a lot of us aren't aware of, except for like experts in your field, and then that's where we learn these things and how you can cultivate You know, it's things. all about exposure. Exposing children to different domains, exposing children to blocks that they can build with, that they can build towers, exposing babies to books. Just, you don't have to read the words. Right. But you can talk about the pictures and show the child. We want to instill that love of reading. Um, but yeah, there was a lot of studies done about with infants that could tell um, when the study was done, children in um, cribs, and they would put up the three objects, and they would watch the children, the babies, 
and, and could tell where their attention was. They would watch the babies. Then they would take those three items down and they would put up four. And you could instantly see that the baby's reaction changed to the fact that there, now there was more items. So these things happen very early. Very early. Well, Julie, very we certainly early. do appreciate you taking some time to come visit us this afternoon. I love being here. You ready to watch some more math? I am. All right, let's well, let's it. listen right now. I know we have a phone call. And is that Anthony on the line? Hello, Anthony. How Hello. are you today? I'm good. And you have an equation for the guys to work out, correct? Yes. All right. As soon as you're ready, let's hear it. Okay. So the equation is 3 parentheses 3x positive 1 parentheses negative parentheses x negative 1 parentheses equals to 6 parentheses x plus 10. All right, well, Anthony, you are calling on a good day because you have two people to help you out with this problem now. <laughs> All right, Andrew, okay. you're, you're an official tutor for the day, right? And I'm going to give you guys about three minutes to solve this. All right, Go. so Anthony, we know we have parentheses. We have some numbers here. What do we know about it already? So we know we're going to have to multiply the 3 multiplied by 3x, and then you're going to have to do 3 multiplied by 1. Okay, so 3 by 3x. Andrew, we good with 9x? Yeah. Okay, let's give him a 9x. And then Anthony, while he's writing that out, 3 times 1 is going to give us? Um, 1, I mean 3. 3. 3, all right, plus 3, perfect. All right, now the next one, minus x minus 1. Does anything really change there, or do we just need to write it down? What are your thoughts? So, we're going to have to multiply negative times x which would be negative x. Right, because really negative. it's a negative 1. So like you said, negative x and then negative 1 times negative 1 gives us? It gives us 1. 1 or positive, positive. 1. There we go. Thank you for being specific. All right. Now we're going to have equals, equals sign, and then the 6. So we multiplied 3 to 3x and 1 previously. Do we do the same thing with 6 to the x and the 10? Yes. Okay. All right. So we do that. 6 times x gives us? It gives us 6x. And then 6 times 10? It gives us 60. Boom, right, perfect. You guys are rolling. Combine so now, like terms. And right, so we talked about combining like terms. And what is required in order to combine them? What makes them like terms? So if it has a variable, it could be added. But if they're different variables, they may not. OK, so, so it, it has um, to have the same variable in order for me to add them together? Mm -hmm. Okay, so like the 9x and the negative x, if I combine those, what do I get on the left side? You would get 8x. 8x, nice. Now, the 3 and the 1, they don't have variables, but am I allowed to combine these, these terms? Yes. Yeah, they're still like terms because they don't have a variable. Very nice. So 3 and 1 gives us 4, and then we're going to equal. And on the right side, 6x plus 60. Anything to combine there? You just write it down. Perfect. All you right. guys are well on your way to wrapping this up in 30 seconds. I know you boys can do it. So now talk to me. I have 8x plus 4, 6x plus 60. I still need to combine like terms, but they're on two different sides of the equal sign. So what are we allowed to do to move them from or transfer from one side to the other? Or what do you think we can do? And if you don't know, so it's okay to say could, I don't know. Um, since we have positive 4 on one side okay. and 60, we could do minus four on the left side and then minus, minus four, on four on the right side. There we go. All right, so now if we and do that, still have eight x equals six x, but now plus 56. All right, are we done now or do we still need to do some movement? We still have to get rid of one of the X is, well, one of the variables on one of the sides. Correct. So we, we don't want to put X with the other term. We want to keep it separated. So it's minus 6X. And if I do 8X minus 6X, what do we get? We yeah, get 2X. Yeah, 2X. Is 2X our final answer, though? No. No, we, we have still have a 56. Simplify. Yeah. So not really simplifying, but now we're still wanting to get the x on its own. So this says 2 times x. And I was talking about in the studio, when we have a coefficient directly attached to a variable like this, whether it's a whole number, fraction, or decimal, this is multiplication. So this is 2 times x. What would be the 
um, the opposite in order to move the 2 or eliminate it and put it on the right side and affect the 56? Um, you would have to divide it by 2. Divide it by 2. Lovely. All right. And 56 divided by 2 gives us... 28. 28. I love it. Perfect. I like how you guys got that done. Nice That's the 28. So, Anthony, for your great call this afternoon, Boom. you got yourself a pass to calm. So, Ooh. congratulations on that. Hopefully, ah! you and your family there was, have an ooh, there was a bear there. To, scared uh, me. Oh. Hey, easy. I'll, I'll tell you a story about that <laughs> bird of prey in just a moment. But right now, we're going to check out more with Isaiah. All right, so Isaiah, we've seen how the tape works, and sometimes, and most often, it probably takes care of a lot of things right away. Mm -hmm. But let's say the tape isn't working and you need to go a little bit further with some treatment. And I know that we were talking about Rebecca's shoulder before and the muscles, and we've got a model here. Yes, so this would be the back of the shoulder is what we're looking at. And when we're looking at swimmers, usually with a lot of forward roll in the shoulder posture, we're looking at a muscle imbalance where the back of these shoulders right here, these external rotators, which is the infraspinatus and teres minor, are not activated effectively enough to keep the shoulder in proper motion. So some of the things we like to do is to maybe heat up that tissue. One of the tools that we like to use a lot is ultrasound. Ultrasound is a tool that we can use in terms of treatment. There's no one tool that fixes everything. Um, but this is one that has many applications and many uses. Okay. So, how far down does that have to go in order for you to get the reading that you need? So, with therapeutic ultrasound, they're essentially what we're using is a small crystal in here, which when sent electricity through this, creates a vibration sound wave. Okay. And that sound wave pierces into the skin something around maybe like 3.3 hertz, we're getting something a lot more superficial. The higher the frequency, the faster the tissues essentially absorb the energy and create a heating sensation. Now, if we lower that frequency to something about 1.0 hertz, we get down a lot deeper into something more like muscle tissue, which would be very beneficial for this patient right here, like Rebecca. Okay, so where will you be doing this then? So I'm going to first apply some ultrasound gel. Apologize, it'll be a little cold. And then I will set the machine. To our function. First, I'll change the frequency down to something a lot more deep in terms of one megahertz. And I'm gonna keep my duty cycle to continuous, which basically means it will constantly send okay. sound so waves. Okay, so it's continuous. Yes. Okay. This would be good for something like chronic or something that we need to get heat down in the area. If this were something that was a lot more acute or had um, really recent inflammation, we would change the duty cycle to something maybe like 50%, so we're not Overdoing it, okay. yes. So this would be on right here. And the last thing I'm going to do is turn up the intensity of these sound waves to about 2.0. That way I can effectively treat an area without having to spend 15 plus minutes to make sure that the tissues get up to the optimal temperature. Okay. Uh, the other thing I'll need to do is make sure that I'm moving it, the head constantly, so that we are not radiating one area, which would essentially create in. Well, I was going to say, you yeah. want to keep it pretty consistent in mm -hmm. what you're doing. An overlap, essentially, and the tissues would get so hot that it would burn her, and this would not be a very <laughs> successful treatment. Uh, uh, back to the tape again, right? Start over. Oh, right, I'm kidding. <laughs> exactly. Um, the other thing that I need to keep in mind as well is I need to make sure that my treatment area is only about, at a maximum, of about two to three ERA, which is effective radiating area, and that is based on the size of my ultrasound head. Okay. So I'm only. So you could have a larger one if it needed be. Exactly. If there's something, or maybe a muscle, if we're talking about 
the quad, which is down the femur, attaches to the knee, and we needed to get a large area, we would use a much larger head okay. to cover that area. And so this is the next step if somebody needed a little bit more treatment would exactly. be the ultrasound. Mm -hmm. So then you would take the results and then you would then consult with the athlete on the next steps. Exactly. And what we often follow up with this, because this gets us in a good position, the tissues are warm, we're feeling a little bit better. But then what we would like to follow up next is rehab, rehabilitation, essentially. And I think that's where we'll head next. Awesome. All right, we've got Andrew, a sixth grade student from Sing Lum, and they said they were working on fractions and percents and things like that in class. So I've got a percent problem for you. All right, boys, so what do you so think? First, we need to put the 75 over 100. Right, because 75 percent is a fraction, really. And then, okay. Um, a is the part, and we don't know the whole, so I'm just going to put whole. All right, I love it. And these need to be equivalent somehow? Yeah. All right, what do you want to do to solve it? But, um, our teacher taught us like to do like, like to multiply or something, and then divide. Like, yeah, yeah. But dividing by seventy-five. Now I'm going to give you a hint here. Mm -hmm. You ever heard of simplifying? Yes. Can I simplify seventy-five over hundred to way smaller numbers, which might make it easier to work with? Yes. What we can, can we simplify uh, it to? Divide by five, so it's fifteen over twenty. I'd go bigger. And Keep then, going. And then you can do th a three. Oh wait, divide by. Uh, three over four, so it's three fourths. Ah, okay, cool. I'll, I, I was like thinking the money thing. All right, so instead of 75 over 100, let's change it to 3 fourths. Yeah. Boom. I love it. All right, 88 times 4. Okay, I'm just going to do that. Okay. And while you guys are working on that, we're going to come back to you guys in just a moment while right now we visit Perfect. Isaiah for one last time. <laughs> All right, so we've started with taping. We did a little bit of uh, treatment, but now we've got the rehab room. And with us today is Jimmy, how are you? Good, how you doing? Good, nice to have you with us. And as you know, we've been talking about the shoulder with Rebecca, and we were taking a look at the muscle. And the muscle that we're talking about, you're gonna show us on Bob. Yeah, yeah, so a um, couple of models here to make it make sense. Um, so if we're looking at a left shoulder model, so this would apply right here. You guys were talking about a couple of the external rotators, the muscles that help to open up your arm outwards, right? And those would fit along your scapula bone here. There's another muscle along the top called the supraspinatus. It basically runs through this canal, and that muscle helps to raise, lift your arm in the air. So like you're gonna raise your hand in a class. When we work on an athlete's like injury or work on their shoulder, we try to address a couple of different muscles, both their rotators in the back as well as a muscle on the top. So with her swimming coming mm -hmm. over like this, yeah. Yeah. that's what you're addressing here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you know when you raise your arm over, shoulder, over the top like that and you're going to go for a freestyle swim, you're going to use a variety of muscles, not just one. And so when it comes to rehabbing those muscles, sometimes we got to do different exercises to work different areas. Now we see where we're doing this. So let's take a look at Rebecca and see what the next steps are as far as some rehab and what she's going to need to do. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so Rebecca, so what we're going to do is we're going to do a, a single exercise that helps that supraspinatus shoulder muscle, the one that helps to raise your arm up. So I'm going to show you and then you'll come and do this and I'll, I'll guide you a little bit. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna grab from a low anchor point, you're gonna put it behind your body like this, okay? You wanna step out a little bit. Your thumb wants to be uh, pointed away from you. And then the most important part of this is slightly turning your body outwards, okay? And then the motion, so this is the setup, this is the starting point. And then from there, you're simply gonna keep your elbow straight and you're gonna bring your hand out about 10 or 15 degrees away from your side. And that's it, that's the total motion right there and you return to behind your body, all right? And that's the motion. Let's see if you can do that. And as you're doing that, we can see some of the angles and stuff like that, that kids are like, all right, well, 15 degrees, well, how much is that? Yeah. You know, it's, like, it's a slight turn. It's a slight motion. And so the most important point of this whole exercise is that once they're set up, they turn out a little bit. The reason for that, let me grab this model, that supraspinatus muscle that we were talking about it actually runs slightly angled. 
from back to front. It's not a direct horizontal muscle. Which is why you want them turned yeah. like so this. So you want one. them okay. turned so that the angle of pull, and you want to keep this hand close to your body, you essentially want to bring it to the front. There you go, just like that. And what that's going to do is it's going to make a parallel line between the resistance band and the muscle. So now you are, um, I would say, isolating onto that supraspinatus a lot more. And if you do this correctly, Rebecca, you, she should be filling it right about here into her shoulder, yeah? All right, and so that's how we can get after that muscle more particularly to help her. And obviously these bands, if that is a little too difficult for her to do at that mm -hmm. point, you can just switch out the bands yep. based on the resistance because you don't want her injuring it more yeah. trying to pull the band. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We can adjust different colored bands, different resistances. We can have the patient step in or step out. We can do quite a few things to address that right there. Okay, so I noticed you've got a couple of different spots mm -hmm. for the bands to go. Yeah. So are there any other ones that she would be able to use with these bands to help with her shoulder mm -hmm. in rehab also? As far as, like, we saw that that one is at the very bottom. At a low angle, and yeah. And that one. Yeah. So if we look at our different angles here, we can, we can do a low angle, mid angle, or high angle, depending on where we want to pull from. And where we pull from, uh, the wording being the angle of pull, dictates which muscles and which areas we're going to work on. And I know that she had a muscle problem, which is why you guys were focusing mm -hmm. on that. But you, sometimes you hear a lot of people, they're going, well, I've got a rotator cuff problem. It's, like, it's, it's popped or it's torn. Mm -hmm. Is that the same thing or a little bit different? So it can be, it can be a variety of things, but if we know for sure it's the rotator cuff that's causing problems, then we can uh, specifically address their rehab exercises for those muscles. And how long would this rehab normally go? So let's say, all right, she's in here, you know, yeah. it kind of was bothering her, she's doing this. I would assume she's gonna do it at least for a couple of days. So we're talking about averages here. The right. average rotator cuff strain, injury, very common injury. Um, if the athlete, if the patient is coming in and being consistent with their rehab, with their sets and reps, um, probably within a week, okay. we can start to turn it around. They can feel better. All right. Well, yeah. you know what? We certainly did learn a lot about mm -hmm. athletic trainers, what you guys do. Having Rebecca be nice enough to go <laughs> through all of the processes with us, uh, starting with tape, the treatment, the rehab. And uh, we just want to say yeah. thank you to Fresno Pacific University thank for helping guys. us oh, to right. do the math. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you, guys. All right, so you guys were working on a problem and it said 75% of something is 88. And then once you found that number, the next part was what is three eighths of that number, right? So we can see that three fourths, right? Is 75% is the same as six eighths. Yeah. And three eighths is half of six eighths. Do you agree? Yeah. Okay, so if six eighths is 88 and three eighths is half, what's half of 88? 44. You see how easy I was? Yeah. But you guys did it another awesome way <laughs> where what you did is you found the percentages. That's right. right? Yeah. And you did all that. So Andrew, I've yeah. got a couple of questions for you. Did yeah. you learn a little something today? Yeah. Good. That's the most important thing. Well, it's not the most important no, thing. I was like, well, the other did, thing did is you have, you have fun? fun today. Yeah. That's, that's the important. That's the one. Go. That's what we're looking for. Because I know there was a lot to learn today. But until we meet again, continue to do the math. Major support for Do The Math has been provided by Chevron, the Kern County Superintendent of Schools, Edison International, Valley Strong Credit Union, Panama Buena Vista Union School District, and the Kern High School District. With additional production assistance provided by these supporters of education in Kern County and throughout the state of California.